about a year and a half ago, a year ago, Bob Strickhart and uh, Jim Bender asked me to do a presentation on historical flasks. But what they wanted me to do was something very, very basic, okay? They wanted to try to get new collectors involved, and you know, they want different questions to answer, so I'm gonna do the best I can. Those people who are experienced in here, maybe a little bit, you can almost do this, this lecture. For the other people, I hope it's, it's a little bit enlightening for you. So, I started this with my father back in 1959, he started, so, maybe a little while. So, under his tutelage, I just continued to learn. And I have both sons in Bob, Dave and Andrew. Uh, Dave actually put this presentation together, so, good. So, the title of Historical Flask 101, okay? So, alcohol. uses of flask in the 1800s. Historical significance, reference books, modern classifications, and carrying numbers, examples from each group, and the pontal types within the world. So, the first one, the uses of flasks, they were, this is a little bit of joke my, my, my son put in. I don't always drink whiskey, but when I do, I drink it from historical flasks. <laughs> so, and but they're used for utilitarian purposes, and this daguerreotype is quite old, probably from about 1860s, I would say. And you can see a few of these fellows smoking cigars and drinking out of a Pike's Peak flask. So, it's kind of a neat, neat piece there. It was used by the common man, as you can see. Some flasks were used to commemorate political and historical events as well as general advertising. So, this might be for a political historical because it has Washington on one side and Jackson on the other. It's a Group 131 charted in McCarran's and it's most likely blown up in Keene. I tried to keep flasks local area, but naturally I had it diversified later on as we go through the slides. This one's a Union flask from the Civil War, two hands shaking, trying to make up. And this one's really, really a political one with the tippy canoe on it, cabin flask. Reference books. We have two reference books that are of high importance, okay? The first one is American Glass, Public by, published by George McCarran and his daughter Helen McCarran, 1940. What they did, that was really a foundation. Not only did they chart the flasks, but they did a little bit of everything, from cup plates to sandwich glass, they did the whole works. That's why they called it American Glass. In that book, they charted the flasks from group, different groups, from group one one, all the way up to group 10, different, different charts, okay? In 1978, Mr. McCarran died, so Helen took over with Ken Wilson, and they published American Files and Flasks in their ancestry. That particular book, there were so many flasks that were uncharted in the American Glass book that they added another five groupings. So it goes from group 1-1 one, one, all the way up to group 15, okay? We'll go through some of these at, at later on. It's important if you're gonna collect, especially American glass, any type, that's the book, but if you wanna collect flasks, that's what you need, American flask. That's like the Bible, okay? And if you do purchase one of those, which you most likely find here, some for sale, not you can find them on, online somewhere. Amazon probably has or something. Um, please read the book, okay? It's important to read the book before you buy a bottle, in my opinion, okay? I get numerous calls, and unfortunately from advanced collectors, and they ask me, do you know uh, if this group number comes in this color? And I say, just read the book. It says yes, it's right there, read the book. Okay? I don't mind if they think they have an enlisted color. I'll be happy to help, help them out. But 
when it's right in the book in front of them, please read the book. Okay? So those are your two books you're going to need. Now, here's the 15 grouping, groupings that they, they listed in the 1978 book. Some of these cross over, okay? Group one are portraits. So you might have presidents, Washington, Jackson, etc., etc. Um, um, so those are mainly just for portraits, the group one one. Group twos are eagles, eagle flasks, okay? Now sometimes you're gonna get a, a president and an eagle. In that case, the president's superseded, okay? So they put them in group ones. You might have a portrait on the front and an eagle on the back. Okay? Third are cornucopias, cornucopian urns. Four Masonic emblem flasks. We're gonna run through these later with some pictures. Group five are the railroads. Group six are Baltimore monument flasks. Group seven are the cabins, which are kind of fascinating. And group eight are sunbursts. Group nine, scrolls. Group 10 is just a general miscellaneous group of everything. So they just didn't know what to do with that. This was from your first book, from the, from the 1940 book. They just kind of threw everything together because that's where the Jared Spencers are and things like that that are not really common to any other grouping. Then back in 1978, they realized that they had no Pikes Peaks listed except for one. And they had, they had a list of Union flasks, Victoria flasks, Traveler's Companion flasks, and Lettered flasks. So they added all those groups. It came out to about 703 different flasks they have listed. So you can imagine how difficult that must have been for them to do when you first start something fresh and try to organize it categor you know, categorically. So. Portrait flask, here's one we got for you. It's a group 114. This depicts President Washington on the front and an American Eagle on the back. Just like I told you, it's gonna, it's gonna, you know, the bus is gonna um, be more important than the Eagle on this. This particular flask is probably, I chose this, is probably one of the most historical flasks around, okay? For this reason, those of you who don't know it, in 1826, 50 years to the day after signing the Declaration of Independence, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson died within hours of each other, just coincidentally, okay? So the Kensington Glass Works in Philadelphia produced this flask, most likely circa 1826. The edges, sides say Adams and Jefferson, July 4th, AD 1776 and Kensington Glass Works, Philadelphia. It says on it. So just coincidentally, right to the day, July 4th, the signing the declaration, they, they passed away. So that's really one of the most historical flasks there is. This particular flask I have, is, is pictured in green. A lot of these flasks, I didn't put them up in aquamarine because the contrast wouldn't be too good for you to see, okay? This particular flask comes in various shades of color. Okay, there's green, there's sapphire blue ones, and there are amber ones. The amber one probably being the best one. Okay, they're all would be multiple thousands of dollars if you get them in color. But aquamarine ones, you might find them tomorrow or tonight out on the table. And they're all, the aquamarine ones should be all under hundred, oh, this would be hundred thousand, all under about a thousand dollars, about six, seven hundred dollars. So for the beginning collector, it's a starting point, okay? There's nothing <coughs> wrong with collecting aquamarine flasks. You can make a great collection collecting aquamarine flasks if you want. I bet you could put a, a set of 300 together in no, no time at all. So, I mean, you know, don't poo poo the aquamarines. This is a, a Group 131 flask, which is a portrait. This particular one has both busts on it. We have President Jackson. President Washington. That bottle was most likely blown up in Keene, New Hampshire. I tried to keep it open. Many of these bottles are common in this color. Mostly all these bottles I have up here are pretty common, which you should be able to find. 
I'm telling you, tomorrow is a beginner's course here. So this you might be able to find in, in, on the sales table also. And then not only to this bottle, if you get this in aquamarine, you got a great rarity. So that's why you got to kind of study things. Group two, we have eagle flasks. This is another very common flash you could find out in, out in the gallery tomorrow. It's made in Wilmington, Connecticut. Has a nice big eagle on it. Full-fledged full, full, full eagle in Wilmington Glass Company, West Wilmington, Connecticut. These come in a variety of colors too. We have red ambers, olive greens, and different colors. Once again, all should be under $1,000 for a beginning collector. Nice early pieces of glass. Next is, a, is another, these are eagles with a cornucopia. In, in this grouping, the cornucopia, as we said, were number three. Group three, but once again, if you get an eagle and a cornucopia, the eagle's gonna supersede the cornucopia and they put it in group twos. Okay, so that's a group 273, and that is, that's most likely a keen product too. Once again, if you get one of these in aquamarine, it's not really a great rarity, but it's much better to have than that color there, the olive green ones. And once again, you should be able to find one of those for the beginning collector out on the sales tables tomorrow. Cornucopia flask. This flask is probably the most common flask you can find, okay? Now, like I just told you, if you find them in aquamarine, they're rare. This is the case with this. If you get one of these in aquamarine, it's very rare. Usually. They come in a color like that. They're olive amber, okay? Those bottles are not in olive amber or olive green. You could probably buy for about $100, $110, okay? You'll definitely find some of those out there tomorrow. Okay? But for the beginning collector, it's important to start somewhere. This is a cornucopia. This particular one was blown up in the Lancaster Glassworks up by Buffalo, New York. That, I, these also come in aquamarine, but once again, for color purpose, I put a green one in so you can see the, the highlighting better. This is probably the most common color of that flask that you can get. And if you'd like to collect what they call color runs of flasks with different colors of the same mold, that would be a great one to do, okay? Because they come in many different colors. Not too rare in that color, once again, Probably around the thousand dollar mark. I'm trying to keep everything low for everybody here for the beginning collectors. Group four are Masonic emblem flasks. This particular one is labeled Group Four Six. This is a very, very heavy flask, probably about two pounds or more. Once again, it was probably blown up in Keene. And what's nice about that it has a nice tooled top on it, tooling on a lip, and it's an aquamarine color. These come, I don't know if you watched Mike George's presentation, but these Masonics come in various different colors. Purples, blues, you know, striated ones. Once again, those are gonna be in the multiple thousands of dollars, not for a beginning collector. These you can probably purchase right around 1,200, 1,500 in that area. So we're kind of still close to that thousand dollar range. I'm trying to show you a flask that you can be able to afford. Here's another Masonic one with an eagle. This one says Keen right on. That's, that's, a, that's another um, New Hampshire bottle, obviously. Very common. Three to four, five hundred dollars. You should be able to find one tomorrow, or tonight, when they put it on the table. If you get this one in aqua, you got another good rarity, okay? So you have to study things to get the colors right. Group five one. Lancaster, New York Railroad Flask. Success to the railroad. The railroads were getting built up in those days, so they decided to commemorate them with, with historical flasks. So once again, this is an aquamarine one, and you can get a whole color range of those if you like. Those, those, once again, there'll be multiple thousands of color ones, and this one should be right in that area of about a thousand. Trying to keep everything down to your level in the collectors here. Here is a Group 5-8 railroad flask. A lot of the railroads you're going to see are going to have success to the railroad on both sides. I chose this one 
because it has an American eagle with stars, which is kind of a little bit unusual compared to, to, to the railroad, railroad on each side. That particular one is made in Coventry, Connecticut, and it's one of the nicest flats because usually the eagle is very well embossed. And you new collectors don't ever use the word, it's, it has a good strike, because it just rings my ear terribly. <laughs> We're not collecting coins here. Those are struck, okay? These are blown, so you have to say, for our new collectors, it's very well embossed, okay? No strikes allowed here, okay? Here's our Baltimore Monument flask. Here's your Baltimore Monument, just a little half pint color. And it says, a little more great, Captain Bragg. Does anybody know what the great means? Grape shot. Right, grape shot. So that's another very historical one. This one's even kind of hard to find in aqua. They do turn up, but in aqua marine, it's a little bit difficult to find. You got one. Somebody's got one. OK. These are for another Baltimore monument. Corn for the world, the Baltimore monument on it. Once again, you get a variety of colors of these, from purples to blues, all different ones. You get a nice color run of those, and they also come in aquamarine, which is priced for the beginner. Cabin flasks, group sevens. Have a group seven three and a group seven four. If you can notice, the top corners on this is pointed, and this one's tapered. The reason being is, this one is the, the first one they blew, and they had problems blowing it. Because when they blew it, the top corners would blow out. You have a hole. So they said, gee, what are we going to do now? So what they did was they reworked the mold, and they chamfered the corners up on the top. Okay? That actual mold, if you're in the Philadelphia area, you can stop in at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and they have the actual mold there with the, with the they put a little piece of metal in it on the corners to prevent it from blowing out. These you're not gonna get for under under a thousand dollars, okay? These are probably gonna be in the three to five thousand dollar range if you find them. But Cleveringer reproduced this very, very well and you have to be careful. What I usually look for on these flasks is the period after the word whiskey, okay? If it has a period after the word whiskey, you're halfway home for being good, okay? However, I've even seen unscrupulous people put two-part epoxy after whiskey and use it as a period. So you have to be careful and scrape it off with your finger. What you have to do if you're really interested in one of these flasks Buy it from a reputable dealer or a reputable source, if you're, if you're a novice here, okay? Because the early ones are a little bit difficult to tell. All these flasks that I've given, shown you are all possible to buy tomorrow. You might find them. The next one's not going to be possible to buy, I don't think. Things happen, but I don't think you're going to get a chance to buy this one, okay? That's a, that's a typical new flask, okay? A little story on this flask is as follows. That particular flask was in the Corning Museum of Glass, okay? Back in the 1950s, Ken Wilson was the curator of glass there. He's the one who wrote American Glass and American Bottles and Flask in their ancestry with Helen McCarran. He was a curator of glass. There was another great collector, Crawford Wetlawfer. He was from Buffalo. He visited Ken that day. That he, he, was, he visited Ken at the museum that day, just randomly talking. And in walks another one of these from a lady in upstate New York. Okay, so they're all dumbfounded here. They can't believe this is happening because this was the only one known at the time. Okay, so Mr. Wetlawfer, who had just a spectacular collection of everything, not just glass but blown glass. He got real interested in this one. This one's a little damaged. It has a repaired corner on the top and a couple cracks. But pre that was the only one known at the time. So 
Mr. Wetwolfer got real interested in that flask. So I have this document from a letter from Ken Wilson. Ken says, whatever you pay for that perfect flask, I'll buy the damaged one from you. So Ken Wilson said, I'd like to do that. He goes, but I don't own the flasks here. He goes, I'm the curator of glass. We have to go through the board of directors to do this. So Mr. Wetwolfer just kept hammering away at him, hammering away at him. I want that bottle. I want that bottle. Finally, they purchased the perfect one for $750. Crawford Wetlawfer purchased the damaged one for $750. Okay, so today there's still only two known. And uh, that's the story on that, except for Mr. Charlie Gardner, who found out that the bottle was sold and not auctioned because it came from a public museum, hit the roof. He really went crazy. <laughs> Ken Wilson said, it wasn't a good scene at the time. But uh, I just want to show you that one, because that one I don't think you're going to find out on the floor. But that's quite, quite an historical one. Sunburst flasks, group eight <coughs> ones. These are also most likely keen. They're very heavy, like that Masonic. They weigh about two pounds. And these come in a variety of colors. And just to, this is what you have to study if you want to be a good flask collector. These are group eight ones with a little bullseye in the middle. And group eight twos don't have the bullseye. Okay? So there's all these little differences you have to learn. You don't have to, but if you want to learn, that's the way you're going to have to do it. Check in the book. Read that book. These come in a variety of colors, too. Once again, this one here, you might find an aqua out on the floor. 800 to 1200 depending within everybody's range if you're going to be a flash player you got to figure you spend at least a thousand dollars or something decent you know what i mean or under sunburst the group eight eight very common bottle you might find one of those too this says keen right in the oval and p and w in the other oval stands for perry and wheeler those are the superintendents i believe the glass works at the time but that's a very common bottle, but they're very, very nice. They're well decorated and have a lot of pizzazz. Group 910, scroll flasks. I put this kind of pinky one up because of all the flasks that you can collect, the group 910 number is the flask where you can most likely get the most colors available and a color one. I bet you you can get 25 or 30 colors. Okay, of that flask. And I'm telling you right now, you will definitely find an aquamarine one of those out in Florida tomorrow. I don't even have to check with that. I mean, that's going to happen. $100, $125, depending. The scrolls are a study within themselves because they have star points. There's a star up here and a star down there. You have, they even drive me crazy, to be honest with you. I have to check the book. Some have eight star points and six star points on the top. Some have five on the top, four on the bottom, etc., etc. So it's quite a, quite a study. Fred Salisbury in Minnetonka, Minnesota, collected them for years, and he really assembled one of the best collections. And they were auctioned off back in Garth, I think, in 1989 or 1991 in that area. They come in different sizes too. Okay. This one's a gallon, it's a big one, okay? Huge bottle. And you also come with little tiny ones. This one's a group 930, and little tiny ones are like group 940s. So they come in a variety of sizes. An interesting anomaly to this bottle, there are some clear examples known, no colored ones except aqua and the clear, and I do consider clear a color. There is no pontal scars on these. They're all been ground, polished pontals. Okay? They think they did that because they might have used these as decanters on the table and they didn't want to scratch the wooden table with the sharp pontal. So all of none of those, even the, even the clear ones, all have a polished base on them. Polished pontal. The pontals have been polished off. Miscellaneous flask, group 1019 should find one of these out there tomorrow too. 
and ocarina out in my beginning collectors. They would find ocarina ones of those, and they come in different sizes. This is a quart, they have a pint. They also have a half pint. That's a little bit more difficult to find, the half pint. But these come in a variety of colors, from blues to browns to ambers to greens. All You can put a nice color on those together, too. You even have a purple one or two. What's interesting about this, it's a summer and winter, they call it. No leaves on the tree here for the winter. Leaves on the tree here for the summer. So. And this is a, um, a Stoddard bottle, New Hampshire bottle, and uh, quite historic, as you can see, with an American flag on it. It says, New Granite Glass Works, Stoddard, New Hampshire. So that's a, that's a very, you won't find, I don't think you're gonna find one of those out there tomorrow. But, but in Mr. Heckler's upcoming auction, I believe in September, they do have one of these available. So you'll have to pay a little bit for that one. These also come in a half pint size, which are a little bit rarer than the pints. And an anomaly to this flask is, I would say there's probably about 30 to 35 around. But the problem with them, a lot of them are damaged. There's cracks in them, chunks out of the neck of them, holes in them. So to get a perfect one is pretty good. I think Mr. Heckler does have a perfect one coming up in the, in the auction. So. Next are Pikes Peaks flasks. Now we're going to move into the section that was previously unlisted prior to 1978 when the new book came out. Pikes Peaks Flask. This one says on it, Old Rye. So you know what that's for, for whiskey. This is a little half pint, group 1011. I put this one in aquamarine. These do come in some colors. They'd be very, very rare to have them in color. And uh, they were usually made in the Pittsburgh area in a little town called Serrano, which I don't believe is incorporated anymore. It's in West Virginia. On the back of some of them, they have Serrano in the oval, okay? I don't think it's an incorporated town, but these are mainly made for the gold rush to Colorado. So what they do is they blow these, and before they hopped on the, the wagon train, they pack these with them for the whiskey to take across the country. So they were businessmen, too. This is a colored one, a group 1130, so you can see how nice they are. These are a little bit rare when you get them in color. And they, they have a, a prospector with a little pack, backpack and tools on it, walking with a walking stick, and an American eagle on the back. This eagle, we, we, we nickname some of the guys that we know. It's kind of an unusual name, but one of the fellows who collects these, he calls this type of eagle. Some of them have um, ribs in the eagle. This has like feathering. So he calls those the hairy eagles, okay? It's a little funny name that we go by. Now, I got a neat thing to show you coming up. It's an actual mold one, okay? That's why I chose the group 1130. This one was deaccessioned from the Strong Museum in, in uh, Sir, I believe it's Rochester. Rochester, New York was deaccessioned and put on eBay. When it came up on eBay, to buy it now, I couldn't type fast enough to get it. <laughs> but I was fortunate to get it. And when we first got it, there was no really mold hinges on here. There was just two halves of the mold. So what we did was this, just to go back. There's a possibility, this is the, this is the bottle that came from a, a mold similar to that, but there's a slim chance that this bottle could have come from that mold because the neck on it is very, very wide. And if you look at the mold, the neck on it is very, very wide. So I'm not saying that it came from that mold, but there's a possibility. So what we did was we sent it down to Batso Village at the start, and they hinged this mold up, and they put these hooks on it so they can blow the glass and open it because it would get too hot. And what they did was a bomb blow. They couldn't blow them, okay? These, these skilled glass blowers couldn't blow them. They come out with big chunks of glass stuck on the bottom of them. 
they crack before they go into the kneeling oven. The shoulders were blown out of them. So when you think of those kids back in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s who were 17, 18 years old blowing bottles like machines, poof, 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 they were good. So then we gave the mold to our friends in Ohio here, Matt Lacey, Lewis, and John Pfeiffer. And you, what glass works did you bring them to out there? What's the name of it? Frost Glass. Frost Glass. So we, we, we loaned the mold for them out there, and they practiced on it, and they got some good ones to blow. They came out pretty nice. So practice makes perfect, I guess. So, but that's a pretty interesting piece. To my knowledge, I don't think there's another one other than a museum of mold. I think it might be made of magnesium. That's my guess, because I could take the heat. Group 12. Nine, our union flask. These come in aquamarine. You'll find one of these out there too tomorrow. These are common in aquamarine. The reason why I put the color one up so you'd be able to read Pittsburgh underneath and Old Rye. That's a mark. Some of them don't always have Pittsburgh and Old Rye under them. They're just plain, but that's a mark one. A little bit more desirable because of the markings on it. These are um, little cannons. This is a half pint in the amber. These, you, this is a group 1242. You sh might be able to find an aquamarine one out on the floor tomorrow or tonight. Not too expensive. I don't know, 250 bucks maybe in aqua in that area. Not, not a killer. The amber one would be a little bit more difficult to find, but I use the amber one for, for contrast so you can see the cannon. They also come in pints. This is a half pint. They also come in pint sizes and in quart sizes, both. All of which come in color. And the colored ones are, well, the pints in the amber will be in your ballpark to buy. The quarts in the amber and the olive yellows will not. The quarts are a little bit scarce, and this is a very rare a half pint color. We're in a group of 13s. Victoria flasks. I just picked this one out of the grouping because I know you're going to find them tomorrow out on the floor. Very common flash from Westford Glass Company, Westford, Connecticut. This one's nice, has all little bubbles on it, one that, so it's a pretty little bottle of sheaf of wheat. No problem. Under five hundred dollars for that. I'm trying to gauge the new collector with some pricing too. Group 1344s. We didn't cover this. This is a calabash shaped bottle. Okay? Most likely blown at the Ravenna Glass Works in Ravenna, Ohio. Every one of these I've ever seen has a nice big iron pond on it. Okay? They also made these as group 1345 and they applied handles to them. There's two different handles, one to the left and one to the right. So those are available. They'll be a little bit more pricey a little bit hard to find, and most of them seem to have the curl of the handle missing. So it's kind of difficult to get a pristine example of that, that flask with the handle on it. But they're very nice bottles, they're well made, and they're good looking. They're, they're, those are calabash shaped. We're into the Traveler's Companion flasks. Group 14-1, most likely blown in Westford, Connecticut. Okay. Travelers above, a star, companion below, sheaf of wheat and on the back for it. These are made specifically for what they say, Traveler's Companion. Most of them, this is a quart, but the, the pints and the half pints are very thin and oval shaped. And it was good to put it in, a, in, a, in your saddle if you're going to travel around because they were flat. So, very common, you should find one out on the floor. Group 15, uh, 14, 7 is another Traveler's Companion flask. And this one's from Ravenna, uh, Ravenna, Ohio also. Has a star in reverse and Traveler's Companion, a little half pint, fit perfect in your pocket, perfect in your saddle, okay? Most all of them have iron pondles. I, I have seen like a yellow green one with a smooth base, but that's kind of a rare color to get. You should be able to find one of these tomorrow too. Group 15-7.
This is more as an advertising floss for glassworks, in my opinion, since it says Stoddard, New Hampshire on one side and Granite Glass Company on the other. I mean, these are just kind of produced for their own glassworks, as far as I can see. These come in uh, open panels. They come in um, iron panels. Rarely, they come with different type tops on them, applied tops. This one's just a straight sheared lip and an open palm. This is a group 1523. It says Union Glass Works and from Connecticut, New London, Connecticut. I think Mike George had one of these posted on his, his talk earlier. And it's kind of scarce to get into color like that. They do come in aquamarine and you find them every once in a while. They're not not too often found. I'm going to show you some pontal types before we close things up, okay? Open tubular pontals on that starter bottle there is probably the first type of pontal they had. In order to get a pontal like that, the gaffer, after he blew the bottle and he wanted to finish the lip on it, the gaffer took his pontal rod, stuck it in a little bit of the hot glass, and then stuck it to the bottom of the, of the flask. And when he snapped it off, when he st after he finished the lip, and before he put it into the cooling, the annealing oven to cool down a little bit, or to, to, to reduce the heat of the glass slowly so it wouldn't crack, that was, that's what was left. Then they came out with the iron pondles, okay? These are Ravenna flasks. And they're kind of known for iron pondles, along with just some other flasks too. But the, but the Pittsburgh area flasks and the Midwestern glass have a lot of iron pondles. A classic rectangular iron pondle that you see there, that would be from um, Ravenna. They're, they're classic for having rectangular iron pondles. They also come with a red iron pondle. And I've even seen common double eagles and aquamarine with red iron pondles. Okay? So there's two different colors of the pontals. Not that it makes much difference, but I just wanted to highlight the fact that they do exist, okay? Then they would have a call, is it, what, oh, excuse me, one second, I'm gonna get back to these iron pontals. Another thing that rings my ear terribly is when I hear graphite pontal. <laughs> there's not one drop, flakes, or anything of, of, of graphite on that pontal, okay? doesn't exist. So you guys go out there and spread the word that there's no such thing as a graphite pond. What that is is iron oxide left from the, the, the uh, pontal rod that they stuck to the bottom of the bottle and when they pulled it off after they finished the lip, that's what you got. So forget that graphite stuff, doesn't exist. Sandship Ponto. This is on a uh, court Wellington Glassworks flasks. Um, what that is, rather than st stick um, the, the pontal rod right onto the bottom of it so you get a, a, an iron pontal, they stuck it in some sand and just stuck it on. So there's some of the sand left. These are a little bit more unusual to find, sand chip pontals. And all of the court Wellingtons in this color that I've handled have a sand chip pontal. So maybe he's kind of wound up that day with seeing on the end of the, the, the rod. Ta-da! <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? I hope I can answer it for you. The uh, old Union flask and the bike tweets uh -huh. with uh, iron and open piles. Every once in a while, that's a good question. There are some union flasks with iron pontals, and there are some with open pontals, but they are kind of relatively rare to find, okay? That little cannon bottle I showed you in the amber, if I can scroll back and find it quickly. Whoops, I went past that thing. This one in aquamarine does come sometimes with an iron pontal, okay? And there's some other ones with the Masonic symbols on them come with open pontals. Okay, those, those will be in Aquamarine, but they're kind of scarce. And there's also a Group 12-2, 
aquamarine one that has an open pond. It's kind of hard to find too. But every once in a while, you will find some with an iron pond and an open pond. That was a good question. Somebody else had a question here? Yes. Well, the earlier ones, this is my son David who put this presentation together. He's the family scientist, so. You got it? I knew I could count on him. Me and computers just don't get along. So I go backwards, David, here, front. Oh, I don't want to go through everything again, but. What were you yeah, I'm sorry. I, mean, I lost my train of thought. Oh, tubular ponto. Yeah, the tubular ponto ones would be the earliest and the most preferred to have. But those iron ones aren't too far behind, okay? They're pretty nice. You gotta be careful of those iron ones sometimes when they clean the bottles. This guy spin them on the tumblers, they'll take some of that iron off. The ones I showed you there, they're dead perfect. There's, they didn't clean anything off of them. They're nice and thick with heavy iron pondles. So sometimes you get square bottles, you know, not flask, that iron, you know, just bottles in general have iron pondles. So quickly, I just want to talk to you. Oh, one more question. Yes, Dana. Could you please explain again about the sand pondle, how they did that? Well, he took the pondle rod and probably dipped it in some sand that they had sitting around there from blowing the glass and just stuck it onto the bottom of the bottle. And when they finished the lip, they pulled it off some of the sand remained. Thank you. Okay? Was it usually on larger bottles? Yeah, for the open tubular pontos, they took, they actually took, after the flask was blown, they actually took the ponto rod and put a little piece of molten glass on it and then stuck it to the bottom of the bottle. That's a good question, I don't know. Um, um, it, could, it could have been mixed together, the ponto rod might have been hot and stuck to it. But that was another good question. I, I, I can't 100% answer that question. But, but uh, not, any other questions I just want to touch? Yes, sir. Right. Yeah. He, the question was the tubular pontos they use another blowpipe, which is correct, okay? I just wanted to touch quickly, because I know I'm probably running over here. Um, condition, okay? When you want to, I myself am a condition freak, okay? When, when I buy a flask, I like to buy it perfect. Unless it's some great rarity, like that Tippy Canoe bottle where there's two known. If you want to get the mold, you have no choice to get the one with the hole in it that was patched, okay? But common bottles, and this is just my opinion, the way I collect, everybody collects differently, and I understand that, and I appreciate that. If I get a common bottle, I want it perfect, okay? I don't like flakes on them, I don't like chips on them. That's just me. Like I said earlier, if you want to get a grouping of aquamarine flasks that are common, you can still do so very reasonably today. And there's nothing wrong with that. They're all historical pieces. They're very nice. Open panels on them, very nice. So, yes, sir. Sure. Uh, when I first got out of the Navy, this might be an answer to the problem you said they had with blowing the bottles. When I first got out of the Navy, I went to work for the Lancaster Glass Works in Lancaster, Ohio, and I worked in a blow shop. And we did things pretty much the same way they did in the 1800s. I, I did all of that. Call boy, open the mold, you name it. But we had a black rubber carbide stick, and we often had to rub that around the bottom of the mold or the door edges to keep the bottles and glass from sticking. You go. Thanks, Gary. Known Gary for 40 years? Yes, okay. So see, I come to these seminars to learn also. There you go. Thank you very much, Gary, for the information. Do we have any other questions? Uh, yes, Dale. Is there another variant on that? Yeah, that's the two-roofed one. That's that's a group seven two, and there's also one with four roofs on it. That's a group seven one. Not as rare as the, the one I have here is the rarest of the two. Rarer of the two, okay? The other one, there's probably, I'd say close to 20 of the other ones, okay? That includes some that are in the museums, but as I always say, 
That doesn't count. And the museums, they're done with. Yep. Thank you. you know what the uh, source is uh, for the cornucopia? We, I'm a little bit lost with what kind of you Where see. does that come from, that design? I'm just curious if you know. Don't know. It's, uh, I researched it. Good, tell us. That's what we're here for. Yeah. Uh, I, like, I like this interaction. Yep. Uh, I researched it and it's the uh, horn of the unicorn. Okay. I can give you the whole history of it, but wow. it's, it's pretty fascinating when you think that a unicorn horn is on a historical flat. Okay, see. I think we all learned maybe there. Dr. Burke. In the early days of my collecting, I heard about iron molds, but I kept hearing about wood molds. Is there really such a thing as a wood mold? I, I don't think so. I mean, they might have yeah. carved a prototype in it before they carved the, uh, they did this metal ones. For the simple reason, if you blow that kind of heat, a molten glass into, into the mold, it's not going to last. It's going to burn right up with the temperature. That's just my opinion. I don't. I don't. I've never seen any any uh, wooden ones. Maybe for a prototype. I don't know. Yes, sir. Yeah, actually, the American Museum in Millville has some wooden molds. What they are is they're half molds. Okay. They're, they're they're half the shape of the bottle. They have a wooden piece on them. They're charred. And what you did is you did your turn molds in there. You did shaping with them. Right. Okay. Will, but not an actual actual thing. blowing into yeah. it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yes, sir. Where was uh, Jared's supplies Most likely Manchester, Connecticut, around 1823-ish in that area. That's a kind of neat flask that says Jared Spencer, and on the other side of the medallion says Manchester Con, C-O-N. No C-O-N-Ns in those days, just Manchester Con. Anything else, or are we all set? Well, I thank you all. Very